Hello friends, welcome to the course on Pedagogy of Mathematics, course code EDU220. I'm Dr. Junaki Ghosh, faculty of the Department of Elementary Education, Lady Sriram College for Women, where I teach courses on mathematics education. In this video session, I'll be talking to you about geometry and visual thinking. And throughout this video presentation, I'll be using PowerPoint slides. So please bear with me while I set this up. So the objectives of the session are as follows. First, we will begin with a discussion about what is geometrical thinking or what entails geometrical thinking. We'll then move on to the Van Heese levels of geometric thought and discuss its implications for learning geometry. Further, we will discuss the role of dynamic geometry software, which are a special kind of software tools available for exploring geometrical concepts and how these can help in conjecture making and also in leading to proof. The keywords are Van Heel's levels, dynamic geometry software, conjecture making, and proof. So what is geometrical thinking? Geometrical thinking may be defined as a set of skills used by mathematicians to solve problems in geometry. Coco et al, 1996, and the research team headed by Coco, describe the following as the geometrical habits of mind. These include proportional thinking, using several languages at once, using a single language for describing objects in different branches of mathematics, and the study of change and invariance. Now, geometry has indeed been identified as a basic skill in the learning of mathematics. It is a central topic throughout school mathematics, as you may have already seen. It is therefore important to provide children with visual experiences. So, in fact, in the primary school textbooks, we find that arithmetic concepts are often represented using geometry. For example, circular cutouts are often used to represent fractions. So when we uh, divide a circle into two parts or five parts or four parts or whatever, and try to show what is the meaning of the fraction half and one third and one fourth and so on, we're actually resorting to a geometrical model, or that is an area model. Even explaining arithmetical concepts, such as the important concept of the distributive property, this can also be highlighted using a geometrical model. For example, we would like to show that 6 into 18, where 18 is split up as 10 plus 8, is 6 into 10 plus 6 into 8. And this can be done by using a geometrical model in the form of these rectangular grids. In fact, this really enables the student to visualize the concept. Now, the Van Heese levels of geometric thought or geometrical thinking are a very important theory which, is a, which are associated with the learning of geometry. It is a very old theory. In fact, a Dutch couple named Pierre and Dina Van Heel were researchers as well as school teachers. They found that their students had faced major difficulties in learning geometrical concepts and they wanted to explore this further and took this up as a, as a study for their doctoral dissertation which they submitted in 1957, which is quite some time ago. And while doing the process of their research, they found, in fact, they identified different levels of development that students undergo as they progress in their learning. And these are often referred to as the Van Heels levels. Typically, there are five levels and usually these are numbered from zero to four. The lowest level, that is level zero, is called visualization. This is, in fact, the visual holistic reasoning level. When students are at this level, they perceive figures and shapes by their general appearance. They do not have an awareness of the parts of figures, such as side lengths, angles, or relationship between the parts. They just look at the figure holistically. If you show them the figure, they can maybe recognize and name the figures. And they can make statements as follows, like they would say that, you know, this is a rectangle because it looks like a door and the door is a rectangle. Or if you, they're also overly uh, impacted by the orientation of, the, of figures. For example, if you show them a square, 
in which the side is parallel to the base of the paper, then they would say it is a square. But if you change the orientation slightly, for example, in this, you just turn the square around a little bit and they will say now it is a diamond. So they get very much impacted by the orientation of shapes and they are not very, uh, they do not focus much on the properties of these shapes. They can only look at them at a holistic, in a holistic manner. So this is the level zero or the lowest level of the Van Hees levels. The next one is level one. This is a level called analysis. And this is also the descriptive analytical reasoning level. Here students are now able to analyze the figures and recognize their component parts. So given a shape, for example, in a square, they will now be able to point out and say, which are the angles, which are the corners, or which are the sides and so on. However, these properties are isolated and unrelated. So given a particular shape, they may be able to identify its specific component parts, but they do not understand the relationship of different types of shapes and how these properties are related to each other. So these properties remain isolated and unrelated at this stage. So they'll be able to describe a square or a rectangle in terms of the properties of side lengths and angles, but will not be able to say that a square is a particular type of rectangle or that a rectangle is a special kind of parallelogram. So inclusion properties between shapes are not possible at this stage. Level two, the third level is the level of abstraction, which is a relational inferential reasoning level. Inferences about characteristics of shapes are generally made from observing many examples. For example, in a parallelogram, opposite sides are congruent. So when a student looks at various kinds of parallelograms with various side lengths and various angles and observe one commonality that in a parallelogram, the opposite sides are congruent. So they're able to make this, generalize this relationship uh, among the sides of a parallelogram at this level. Students are able to see relationships between figures and relationships among the properties of figures. So now they will be able to say that squares and rectangles are quadrilaterals with four right angles. So they can classify shapes now and see their common properties and compare and contrast and so on. At this stage, definitions become meaningful to them. Logical deductions and class inclusions are possible. So they can say now that uh, squares belong to the class of rectangles and rectangles belong to the class of parallelograms and so on. So class inclusions become possible at this stage and they get familiar with definitions and definitions begin to have meaning for them. The fourth level is a deduction level or the formal deductive proof level. Here, the student is able to do some formal argumentation and actually arrive at proof. So they understand definitions, axioms, and simple theorems. They understand deductive reasoning and are, and are able to construct proofs giving reasons for each step. And this becomes a very important goal for most high school geometry, especially in our curriculum, where by the stage of class nine, the student is expected to uh, prove different kinds of theorems and provide reasoning. At this stage, they understand the role of definitions and also understand the meaning of necessary and sufficient conditions. They're able to prove properties such as congruency and similarity of triangles, they can prove circle theorems, prove theorems about quadrilaterals and other shapes and so on. So this is the formal deductive level. The last level is that of rigor. Here students are able to reason about alternative axiomatic systems. In fact, they can reason like mathematicians. They can engage with non-Euclidean geometries. For example, here, are, here is an example of taxicab geometry where we are no longer in the two dimensional plane, but we are now on a grid. So if there is a point here and a point here, and you want to find the shortest distance between these two points, it will not be this green line, which is actually the Euclidean distance between these two points. But in taxicab geometry, you can only move along these grid lines. So you can choose a path which goes along these gray grid lines and any path which connects these two points will be a distance. So if this is how distance is defined, then what, how, what happens to the distance formula, which we know in Euclidean geometry, which comes from the Pythagoras theorem, and how is a unit circle defined and so on. So if a child reaches the level of rigor, that is the highest level of the Van Hills level, then they can actually engage with other kinds of geometry. And, how, and though this is not really expected 
of students in school mathematics. And perhaps we can say that the highest level that is usually achieved in school mathematics is perhaps level three, that is of deductive reasoning. But most, of, most often students do not go beyond level two, that is the level of abstraction. So what are the implications of Vanier's levels for learning geometry? These are levels of thinking in understanding geometrical ideas, and they may sometimes occur as obstacles to students. Students cannot skip levels by learning. Rather, tasks should be designed to transition them from one level to another. So if a student is at level zero, they cannot jump to level two without going through level one. Concepts which may only be implicitly understood by students at a lower level become explicit at a higher level. So teachers should provide students with adequate experiences to familiarize them with new ideas. Also, another important thing about the Van Hees level is that these levels do not depend upon age or maturation of the child. So there is no age specific aspect that if a child is of, of, of a certain age, then they must be at level two or level three and so on. The levels achieved by any child is entirely dependent upon the geometry experience that she or he has had. So teachers should try to identify the level of their students and plan their instruction accordingly. Usually there is a gap between the level of the students and the level of the teacher, I and mean the level at which the teacher is teaching. So for example, if the student is, a, is at level zero and the teacher is, uh, has designed tasks at level two, and expects the child to be able to perform those tasks, then that will not happen. And this leads to a lot of uh, obstacles on the part of students. So in order to transition students smoothly from one level to another, there could be some interesting tasks that could be assigned to them. So one, one interesting task which can be given to transition students from level zero, that is the holistic, visual holistic level to the analysis level, that is level one, is that of the seven piece diagram puzzle, which consists of five uh, isosceles right angle triangles, a square and one parallelogram. Now, these can be given to the children as cutouts, they, can, they are also available as wooden models and so on. So if you suppose ask the child that using any two shapes among these seven pieces, make other shapes such as make a triangle, make a square, make a rectangle or make uh, a trapezium using only two out of these two pieces out of these so this kind of a task would actually help the student to not look at the, uh, the individual pieces holistically but to think about the properties of these shapes which will enable for example the child may notice that joining the two small triangles we would get this medium sized triangle here or joining these three triangles we would get a bigger triangle here so these kind of associations can be made by the child only if the child is able to focus on the properties of these shapes. And therefore the tangram puzzle could be a very good task to assign to transition students from level zero to level one. For level one to level two, paper folding activities are highly recommended. These suppose uh, paper folding activities helps to identify relationships by folding, measuring and looking for symmetry. So for example, we can give a student a sheet of paper and say that uh, create a quadrilateral which has two lines of symmetry, which has exactly two lines of symmetry. And by folding, if the child makes a rhombus-like shape, then we would know that the child is well conversant with the properties of a rhombus and also how to achieve them by folding. So this could be a very interesting task to transition the student from level one to level two. That is analysis level to the abstraction level. For level two to level three, that is from abstraction to deductive level, we could ask students to identify shapes which satisfy given properties, use models and drawings to make generalizations and conjectures. So slowly they should be moved towards making argumentation and to reason with shapes. Finally, to transition students from level three to level four, they could be made to explore different proofs of the same result. For example, the very, uh, they encounter the Pythagoras theorem many times in their syllabus. And they could be encouraged to ex explore different geometries. 
So for example, if you look at the Pythagoras theorem, there are many proofs available. So this could this depicts a dissection proof of the Pythagoras theorem, which states that we all know what the Pythagoras theorem states, that in a right angle triangle, the square on the hypotenuse is the area of the square on the hypotenuse is equal to the area of the squares on the two legs of the isosceles triangle. Now you can prove this by a dissection method where you dissect the bigger square into five equal parts and each of these five parts actually come from the two smaller squares. So it is more like a puzzle, picking up these five pieces and fitting them onto the big square here. This could be a very interesting visual proof of the Pythagoras theorem. But an alternative proof is also possible where you do certain constructions and use other geometrical results and theorems to prove the Pythagoras theorem. So exploring different proofs of the same result would really help to uh, raise the thought level, geometric thought level of the student from level three to level four. Now we come to understanding of fundamental shapes and how that takes place in the mind of children. Students build their own definitions of shapes from examples in everyday life because their first experience of shapes comes from everyday life. And that is how they build their own prototypes, that is their own mental images. But these prototypes are often very limited. For example, they may be, they may, uh, be tempted to think that altitudes of a triangle always lie inside a triangle or the diagonals are always inside a polygon, or the right angle triangles must have the right ang angle oriented towards the bottom, or that the isosceles triangles must have the base at the bottom and so on. There are many such prototypes that children tend to have. But engage, making them engage with shapes, different kinds of cutouts, exploring properties and showing them different, uh, different examples, or counter examples, for example, in the case of an uh, obtuse angle triangle, you could well have an altitude which lies outside the triangle. Or in the case of a concave quadrilateral, there could be a diagonal which actually lies outside the quadrilateral. So it is important to help the children uh, engage with such examples, which help to build their mental images and their prototypes. Understanding definitions. There are two kinds of definitions typically in geometry, especially. One is the hier hierarchical definitions which help in deductive reasoning. For example, squares are special rectangles, rectangles are special parallelograms, and parallelograms are special quadrilaterals. So this kind of a definition of quadrilaterals is hierarchical in nature and it also shows the inclusion properties that squares, the properties of squares are included in the properties of rectangles or that the properties of rectangles are included in that of parallelograms and so on. So this is a much more meaningful way of presenting the definitions of geometrical shapes. Partitional definitions partition concepts into mutually exclusive bins. So if you define squares and rectangles separately as different kinds of quadrilaterals listing out their properties without suggesting that one is a subset of the other, then they would not be able to have a relational understanding of shapes. In general, students take to partitional definitions more easily. But we should help them and we should encourage, we should create tasks to help them understand more of hierarchical definitions. Now I come to a very important aspect of learning geometry, which wasn't there about 20 to 30 years ago. And that is that of a kind of digital software tools called the dynamic geometry software. So what is a dynamic geometry software, an acronym, acronym for which is DGS? In a dynamic geometry software, geometrical figures are dynamic and can be manipulated rather than static pictures on paper. So you, if you draw a triangle on a, on a dynamic geometry software, you can actually drag the vertices of the triangle and change the, change the triangle in various ways. So it is no longer a static figure that way, as when you draw it on a paper and pencil. Parts of a figure, as I said, can be dragged in the geometry window and its measurements will automatically dynamically change in the algebra window. By dragging, we can observe properties which remain invariant and those which vary and this helps us to make properties and also make conjectures. In fact, researchers have described a dynamic geometry software as a micro world 
which provides the user with rich opportunities to make and test conjectures. So let us see, when we, uh, GeoGebra is, a very, is, a very, is an open source dynamic geometry software. And dynamic geometry softwares help us to explore geometrical concepts or many concepts in mathematics using the idea of multiple representations. Now there are almost about 70 such dynamic geometry softwares available, some of which are open source and some of which are licensed softwares. GeoGebra is a very popular open source dynamic geometry software. So when we open a window in GeoGebra, we see that uh, a typical GeoGebra uh, document opens. It has a, a graphics component, a graphics part, and an algebra part. And we can also call in a spreadsheet part. So if you draw a figure in the graphics part, you will find that its, uh, its properties are described symbolically in the algebra view. And we can also explore certain aspects of the figure numerically using a spreadsheet. So it is very much possible to explore a shape graphically, algebraically, and even numerically using a dynamic geometry software such as GeoGebra. So what is uh, special about uh, such, a, such a software tool? It allows us to drag parts of the tool, parts of the object, and this is very much in sync with the variability principle of Zoltan Dines. So the dragging tool of a dynamic geometry software like GeoGebra is a pedagogical tool which is conducive to mathematical reasoning and conjecture formation. And according to Zoltan Dines, way back in 1963, he had stated his variability principles which had two parts, the perceptual variability principle and the mathematical variability principle. The perceptual variability principle states that to abstract a mathematical concept effectively, one must meet it in a number of different situations and perceive its purely structural properties. If I have to take an example from outside geometry, let us take the simple idea of place value. The idea of exchange is central to the idea of place value when we say that 10 ones or 10 units make 110 and 10 tens make 100. Now to understand this idea of exchange, one could help the student engage with this concept using bundles of matchsticks, where single matchsticks represent ones, and bundles of 10 matchsticks represents a 10, and bundles of 10 tens represents a 100, and so on. We could also help the student experience this idea of exchange using an abacus, where one bead on the unit's rod, 10 of these beads on the unit's rod is equivalent to one bead on the tens rod. Or we could also use money as a way of exploring the idea of exchange, where 10 one rupee coins can be replaced by one 10 rupee note and so on. So when the student encounters this idea in multiple ways, using multiple materials, and visits this idea in different, in different structural ways, this leads to perceptual variability of the concept. The mathematical variability principle states that as every mathematical concept involves variables, all these mathematical variables need to be varied if the full generality of the mathematical concept is to be achieved. And this I will elaborate on in the next slide. So in a dynamic geometry software helps the user engage with the varying and the invariant. So in a dynamic geometry software, it is possible to discern critical invariant properties of geometrical shapes under a continuous variation of certain components of the object. For example, suppose we construct a triangle ABC in a dynamic geometry software. We measure the interior angles and also the sum of the three angles. Let us say that we name the three angles as alpha, beta, gamma, or you know, we can name them in whatever way uh, GeoGebra, the software has chosen to name them. Dragging one of the vertices will al allow us to experience variation. So by dragging one of the vertices, so for example, there's a figure here. So by dragging the vertex A, I'll be changing the triangle altogether so we can have this kind of a triangle or this kind of a triangle where the angles are varying and the side lengths are also varying. So when we explore these different variations of the triangle, we are experiencing variation and we'd see different angle measures and different side lengths. So we are engaging and we are focusing on whatever property is varying. 
But we will also observe that the sum of the three angles alpha plus beta plus gamma remains invariant. That is, it remains fixed at 180 degrees. So this interplay of the varying and the invariant helps us to make a conjecture of the, for the angle sum property of a triangle and perhaps helps us to conclude that yes, the sum of the three angles of any triangle should be 180 degrees. This is however only a conjecture and the teacher can take it up from here to lead the student to actually formally proving the result. Another important thing that dynamic geometry software helps us do is to show the difference between a drawing and a construction. So for example, in a dynamic geometry software screen on the computer, I can create vertices A, B, C, D and join them in such a way that the figure looks like a square. But by dragging one of the vertices, I would soon see that it is no longer a square. So the properties of a square are lost. So when I manually do create a square by manual adjustment, the, the figure drawn is not really a square and such a drawing will fail the drag test. That means by dragging, it no longer retains its properties. But if, if I use the actual steps of construction, I mean, I can use the drawing tools, construction tools of the software to actually, so for example, to construct a square first, I will draw a line segment AB. Then at A and B, I can draw perpendicular lines. And then using the circle tool, I can actually draw the circle with radius AB and draw a circle. And wherever this circle cuts this perpendicular line, I will get one of the other vertices of the square. And proceeding in this manner, I can actually create a robust square. So AB, FD is now a robust square. And if I drag one of the vertices of this square, it will continue to remain a square. It may grow in size, it, it may become smaller, but it will still remain a square. So it is very important to highlight this difference between drawing and construction. And this is very difficult to do in a typical paper pencil construction. This dragging tool enables conjecture formation or conjecture making. In a study conducted by Lingerprat and Ghosh in 2016, Seven grade students of it was, it was, uh, this study was conducted with students of two countries. So, seven grade students of India and Sweden used GeoGebra to make conjectures about midpoint quadrilaterals. So, they were asked to draw an outer quadrilateral ABCD, mark the midpoints of the side, four sides, and draw an inner quadrilateral, and explore the properties and describe this inner quadrilateral EFGH. So by dragging the outer quadrilateral, the dragging the vertices of the outer quadrilateral, they created different kinds of outer quadrilaterals and tried to see some common properties of the inner quadrilateral EFGH. And not only for convex quadrilaterals, but even for concave quadrilaterals. And this was a very interesting study as students concluded the actual result that when we join the midpoints of the sides of any quadrilateral, the inner quadrilateral is always a parallelogram. Now, let's look at some of the seven grade students' observations in this study. Firstly, that they observed that opposite sides of the inner quadrilateral are equal because they could see it in the algebra window. Some identified EFGH as a rectangle, that is the inner quadrilateral as a rectangle, some called it a square, some as a parallelogram, and so on. Everything dependent on how they had modified the outer quadrilateral. So the researcher, to probe their thinking, asked, is it a rectangle or a parallelogram? Is, it a, re is a rectangle a parallelogram? Is a square a parallelogram? And by doing, engaging in such questioning, all the properties of different quadrilaterals were revisited by the students. After dragging the vertices, students concluded that EFGH is indeed a parallelogram. But they knew this was a conjecture and they knew that GeoGebra as a software will not tell them how. So they were encouraged to prove that opposite sides of this inner quadrilateral EFGH are parallel. So students felt the need for a deductive proof and many of them started coming up with their own explanations. And it was really heartening to see how they were really craving to prove the result using logical reasoning and not just be satisfied with the observation that the inner quadrilateral is a parallelogram. So the dynamic geometry software uh, gives many affordances. 
They can be used to help students to form powerful prototypes and enhance their concept image. They can be used to help students understand formal definitions, focus on fundamental characteristics of objects to be constructed. Dragging strategies can play the key role in helping them to form conjectures through observations and verifications, and also, most importantly, motivate the need for formal proof. So to summarize, I would like to say in this video session, we have discussed the basic nature of geometrical thinking. We have discussed some aspects of the Van Hills levels of geometrical thinking and their implications for teaching and learning geometry. We focused on children's understanding of shapes and their mental images and prototypes. And finally, we have looked at some basic aspects of dynamic geometry software and how these can be used to enhance learning in geometry. Thank you very much for a patient listening. I do hope you have liked this video session. Uh, here are some references to some important research articles which can help you augment your understanding of geometry and visual thinking. Thank you again.